Good afternoon, everyone. You're very welcome to the first ever Output Sports webinar today. Uh, and we're privileged and delighted to be joined by Dr. Mikey Kiley of Head of Performance at Limerick GAA. Uh, in terms of today's webinar, we'll be doing a brief introduction to ourselves at Output Sports and what we do and why we love working with sports practitioners around Ireland and across the globe. And uh, then we'll be delighted to listen to Dr. M Mikey Kiley's talk talking through return to play, velocity-based training, and a number of key aspects in monitoring and testing in GAA settings. And then finally, we'd be delighted to open up the floor via the chat box to get, give you the chance to talk to Mikey and ask your questions about uh, performance, strength conditioning, and physiotherapy at Limerick GAA. So thank you very much. And just to kind of give you a very brief intro to who we are at Output Sports, we're a brand new sports technology company. We actually launched this week last year and we focus on developing one-stop tools to help you understand and optimize athletic performance. So we were actually researchers in UCD for seven years prior to launching, and our motivations were to make athlete testing simple, effective, and scalable to audiences that where it was never previously possible. So not only working at the elite level in sport, but also working at the club and county levels as well in sport and GA. Our founding team, are myself, Dr. Martin O'Reilly, a sports and exercise engineer, Julian Eberly, a theoretical physicist and data scientist, and Dr. Dara Whelan, who's actually a sports practitioner himself. So as a team, we're really motivated to apply interdisciplinary expertise and listen to end users like yourselves to develop solutions which tr truly help solve your sports performance problems. Our technology, uh, which some of you may never have uh, been introduced to before, is data-driven, it's highly accurate. We like to keep it simple and usable and easy to implement. And it's a one-stop tool for everything off field from power to VBT to balance and strength. So just because this might be the first time a few of you have heard of us at Output, um, I'm going to pass over to our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Dara Whelan, who will actually just walk through the output system to five minutes, which will help provide a bit of context to Mikey's talk that will start at 10 past. So thanks very much. So that's brilliant. Thanks, me and Martin. Um, I promise to be really, really quick because I can imagine you're probably not all here to see myself talk about output. So I will um, try and be as quick as possible with it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to very briefly run through our output sport capture system and our output sports uh, hub system with it. So what capture basically is, is a small wearable sensor capable of measuring multiple components of fitness and that communicates to a hosting device. So any Android phone or tablet, it will communicate to that via Bluetooth. What I'm going to do now is I'm basically going to share my phone screen so you can get a feel for how the system operates as well. So I'm just going to share that screen and fingers crossed you're still going to be able to see both myself and the phone screen. I'm just going to move you guys out of the way. Perfect. So basically what you can see on the front page, first thing to flag is the whole system is cloud-based. So we, you'll see how that could be really, really useful, particularly when we um, bring it into the hub. And we have all the data synchronizing immediately to that with it. But it also means that any data that you collect, sure, collect with the data will be um, automatically synced across different app profiles. So if you have six sensors, it basically operates as if you had six jump mats, six VBT devices, um, six timing gates, etc. You'll also see on the system as well that the front page will have a height and weight tracker in it. So the weight tracker is there, the height tracker will be for any underage athletes to look at maybe long-term athlete development, etc. We also have a wellness metric in it as well. So you can have um, perceived readiness to train, physical well-being, psychological quality and sleep quality. And we do track all of that data along with all the rest of it longitudinally as well. So you can see how you compare it to your, your averages with it. So all of that is captured under my athlete profile and you can have as many athlete profiles as you want. Well, probably the nuts and bolts of the system is more in the objective markers that we test. And this is probably where we differentiate an awful lot in the competition is that we have a broad range of tests with it. So we have upwards of about a hundred odd tests in the system now at this stage with it. You'd be glad to hear, I'm not gonna run through all of those with it. I'm gonna show you a couple of tests that, that Mikey will uh, talk through so you get a feel for how it operates with it. And if anyone kind of wants to see the, the tests or the, the system in more detail, um, please do hit request demo or, or get in touch with us around that as well. So I said the vast majority of the tests are done with a single sensor, except for the speed and agility, which is actually done with the camera of a phone to act like a light gates functionality as well. 
What I'm going to show you is just two tests here. So I'm going to show you bilateral counter movement jump test as a power metric, and then our barbell velocity back squat test as well. So the way that the system operates is you just basically place the sensor on the body location to be tested. And in this case, it's going to go on my foot because I'm going to do a jump. You get the athlete into a position, literally hit record, and then just do the jump. So once you land, you'll get your jump height out. My pretty poor jump height, unfortunately. Um, and you'll also get progress based on previous jump heights, previous jump metrics as well. In that you can view all your longitudinal data. So I can view any of my historical data here. I can also view that in a chart format and be able to see how I compare it to myself over a period of time as well. So this blue box here is plus or minus one standard deviation. I can see if I'm going above that or below that really simply to help with my athlete preparation. The other um, thing to show then around that, because we're talking about it as well, is VBT. So it is a VBT device as well. You literally place it on the bar, you choose your target number of repetitions, weights, and you can either have a maximum velocity that you want to hit or maybe a target range. And again, Mikey will be kind of going into how you utilize <clears throat> this for, for training of athletes with it as well. Once you have it on the bar, again, all you have to do is once you're under the, the right athlete profile, just hit record. And rep on rep. So you can imagine me doing a back squat. You'll be getting your analysis. I'm in the marker there. Once I'm outside of it, you can see it goes white or too fast. And I'll get that feedback. At the end of the set, you'll see all your means and peaks with it. You can edit any of the reps that you don't want to use for analysis for whatever reason. And again, you can also view that progress longitudinally as well. So I can go in and view any of my historical reps with it view again any of the metrics that I would have wanted to assess there so everything from power velocity force etc with it and again I'll show you in the hub how that can be easily graphed as well final thing just to flag as well because particularly if you're working with maybe a large team of athletes with it is the ease of use that you've probably seen an awful lot of athletes are probably able to self-drive this it's literally put it, put, pop it on the right body location complete the task get the data with it and then come along choose your, the right athlete profile and you can move to the next test then as well. The next athlete can come along and literally complete the repetitions. So with that, I'm gonna share with the um, hope. So you'll be able to see that. So I'm just gonna reshare here, reshare here, which I guess that do. Hopefully now you'll be able to see the hope data. So in the hope data here, this is where all that information will be synchronized to. So once you're immediately finished the test on capture, all the data will come through here to the hub. Just to make it a little bit bigger. So the first thing you're greeted with here is all your athletes and their rag statuses. So you're able to see basically is an athlete in a red, amber, or green state in the key performance indicators for them. You've chosen those key performance indicators here in the settings tab. So you can choose what you perceive to be those um, important metrics. And you choose those thresholds as either, you know, percentage thresholds or standard deviation thresholds. So if an athlete is within 5% of their uh, normative range, they'll show up as green. If they're between six and 10, they'll show up as um, orange. And if they're within, uh, sorry, if they're below 10%, they'll show up as red. That will really easily allow you to see basically the athlete. Um, you can filter by those in need of attention, which will top load those with the most amount of reds or those who are the top performing athletes, which will top load the most amount of greens. And <laughs> actually haven't gained it that myself will be at the top there, but I'm pleased to see it. You can also view that data in more detail. So I've clicked on my jump heights there. I'm able to see my graph, my jump over the last month. That's my standard deviation and my average line if I'm above or below that with it. And again, for something like VBT, it might make more sense to have a look maybe at uh, a table view to have a look at the different metrics in more detail, or maybe a set comparison, sorry, maybe a set comparison graph as well to have a look at how maybe an athlete is um, improving over a period of time. So you can have a look at rep on rep analysis in a number of different metrics. All of that can be done at a uh, individual level or at a uh, group specific level. So if you literally hit your group here, so this is our sports science group. Again, you can have your rag statuses and, and top load athletes that way, or do comparison between different athletes as well. So again, this probably isn't gonna compare favorably for myself, but if I compare myself to Martin and our jumps maybe over the past month, that will show the graph for myself and Martin 
I wager that's probably after a pretty heavy legs day for Martin. Usually he's consistently higher than myself with it. And you can add in as many athletes as you want on that to see that data with it. Uh, leaderboards will basically work as to drive intent. These are live leaderboards. So anytime you complete a task on the capture system, this data will sync up immediately. So you can have jump heights or SI, 10 five scores or whatever makes the most sense for your athletes with it. And then really usefully as well, you can generate reports both at an athlete or a group level and have those saved as templates so that when you're looking to maybe communicate um, how an athlete or a patient is getting on, all you need to do is literally type in their name, generate a report. What you'll get immediately is a, um, a PDF that you can then use to share with either the athlete or the, um, let's share this over here, the athlete uh, or maybe the um, coaches, whoever is most pertinent do. So I'll just drag this across. So now you can see what the report may look like with it. So there are my, ask for my RAG statuses, my key performance indicators, my graph of my jumps over the past month, and some back squat data as well. It's a little bit junk data because I'm moving the sensor up and down. But. So that's kind of output in a nutshell. As you can see, output capture basically allows you to test multiple metrics with laboratory grade accuracy, all with a single wearable sensor and with a, um, a camera based Android device with it. And the hub will bring all of that data into one place where you're able to visualize the data. Uh, communicate with different stakeholders in the athlete care and um, drive intent through the use of leaderboards. So with that, um, that's all we'll, we'll kind of talk through about the output system. Obviously, if there's any questions, we're happy to answer at the end of Michael Kiley, um, of Dr. Kiley's talk, and um, it'd be great if you have any further questions to, to touch base with ourselves, either through request them or through the website with it. So um, I'm going to pass over to Dr. Kiley. So Mikey's the head of performance with the Limerick Senior Hurlers. He completed his PhD last year um, and looked at the preparation strategies of professional jockeys and developed a standardized sports specific fitness protocol for the horse racing industry. He's obviously a really well respected coach. He's an MSc in strength and conditioning from LIT and is a, a SNC coach accredited with both the NSCA and the UK SCA and offers consultancy in both coaching and SNC. So with that, I'll pass over to Dr. Kylie, and um, we can uh, leave some time for Q&A at the end. Thank you. Hey guys, um, very welcome to my kitchen um, in what are strange times, um, but hopefully numbers are on the way down and we're back in the pitches and tracks around Ireland and wherever we're listening from um, fairly soon. And um, that was it. Great introduction, thank you, and thanks very much, Delbo, for providing the opportunity for me to talk to you. And um, what, what I'll go through is a small bit on my philosophy and my training principles, because I think they dictate why I would have used output sport and why I will continue to use out, output sport. Um, we we'll then look at my application with uh, some of the Limerick lads, and then we'll finish with a, a case study and a, a return to play protocol that I, I would have completed in conjunction with our medical team, and then we we'll just finally uh, take some questions at the end, uh, following some take home messages. And um, so just to start, um, so in SNC, the word philosophy is very, I suppose, fashionable at the minute. Uh, people like to talk about their philosophy, and I think there's a lot of fluff associated with it. Um, I suppose in theory, we are philosophers, but what I take from the word philosophy is that it's a guiding behavior or principle that guides behavior. Um, now, for me, my philosophy, it's, it should be multifactorial in that it, it will take in many elements of training, um, but it, it shouldn't really be contextual. It should be a strong enough belief system that despite the context, you'll always refer to it and, you, and use it. So why, why is this important or why is it important to have guiding principles? And um, particularly now more than ever, kind of social media has has developed uh, an SNC, I suppose, climate that is totally different. It, it gives you results immediately and very easily. Whereas as SNC practitioners, particularly in team and high level elite individual sports, we know that it takes years to develop and progress both methodologies and athletes. Furthermore, we can't program everything we want. Sometimes new shiny, a new shiny exercise or a new shiny methodology comes in the market, but 
with time constraints and, and real life practicalities of being an SSC coach, you have, if you have guiding principles, you can then revert back to them and it, it, it clears up any kind of conflicts that, that may arise. So I'll just take you through my principles of training at what they are now. Um, firstly, um, it is very important that we listen to our athletes. Um, for example, just to give you an idea, I collect um, GPS, heart rate, SRP, um, sometimes lactate, sometimes uh, urine for hydration purposes. Um, and with all that data, and particularly now where, where there's more roles for sports scientists and, and so on, we often forget two of our greatest tools, um, which are listening and, and seeing with our eyes. Uh, they can collect more data than a device ever can. So it's important that we listen and listen to that lead and, and their perceived exertion uh, or their perceived feel of something. Because no device can tell us more um, than they can themselves about how something perceives to be or in terms of exertion or how it feels. Um, and just to add kind of validity to that, it is important that the relationship is, is, is there. There has to be a trusting relationship. I don't think the the teacher-student relationship will work or the typical teacher-student relationship will work in that context because you need the player to be open with you. So open your ears, open your eyes is my first principle of training. The same principle, I would see that we need to have strong athletes. Um, both tendons and ligaments and the soft tissues must be strong and robust, um, both from a gym perspective and, and an on-field on perspective. Now, where this principle differs is and I, I think we sometimes fall down, and I, I would have fell down for many years. How strong is strong enough? Where, where does the strength stop? So you have to have put in place objective criteria. I have some objective criteria for push, pull, hinge, and squat. Once the players hit them criteria, I know they're strong enough. Um, the, I suppose the academic, um, the academic side of this is quite mixed in how strong is strong enough. But if you understand the demands of the game, you'll know, and then we turn our focus to rate force development, reactive strength, and so on. My third principle, uh, which I value highly, is I prioritize unilateral training over bilateral training. So unilateral training being a lunge, uh, maybe over a squat. And there's two reasons for this. Number one, that it's a continuous monitoring tool. And number two, it kind of, it, it allows uh, or, or justifies any imbalances um, to, be, to be seen. Um, so by having unilateral training in the gym, it, it's a continuous monitoring tool for me. Um, and it's, it's also working at, on stability and strength at the same time, uh, which is quite important for me. That's not to say I don't use bilateral uh, training. I would say hex bar deadlifts would be in the majority of my programs. But particularly in early phase of the season, I prioritize unilateral training uh, in the gym. And that's probably to do with the, the sport uh, and the fact that we spend the majority of time on one leg. My four principle of training is the mastery of intensity and time. They're, they are essentially a bricks and mortar of any successful training program. Um, and when I talk about time and intensity, within this principle, I also ensure that I have valid and reliable measures. Um, we talk about validity and reliability a lot. We need to understand that they are two, con not contrasting, but they there are two different things we need to be able to disassociate between them. And for intensity, for example, I place a, a large, I suppose, emphasis on heart rate because it gives me physiological data. Um, and I, when I look back at my principles, my favorite to GPS data because it gives me an internal response when the GPS can't replicate. And for me, and having done a PhD in physiology, that, that is why that's there. Um, so time and intensity are my fourth. I think to master them, um, or I suppose mastery is, is difficult or probably over the top, just to be as proficient as you can and understand time and intensity both in the gym and on the pitch. My last training principle uh, is inspired by Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. So to, to start that part, I think it's unbelievably important to have a plan, whether that's a traditionally periodized plan or what, what's kind of coming into the literature now is tactical periodization, where you're implementing all the game's demands in conjunction with the management team. Um, but 
regardless if it's traditional or it's uh, tactical, have a plan. And I think the greatest uh, example of, of this and getting punched in the face would be the last 12 months. Come back last January, I know we had a training camp which ran extremely well. And two, two weeks later, we came out of that training camp and we were locked down for five to six months. Um, so in them scenarios where the shit is the fan, essentially, you have to look back over your principles. And once you do, and you have a strong enough belief system, then principles will guide you through uh, the adaptation of, of your plan. So moving on to some velocity-based training, just to provide some context, uh, I'm going to show you a video of Sean McVeigh, who's a, a Donegal hurler and works at out, Output Sports. I was slagging him earlier about his deadlift technique. I think it could be improved. You can decide for yourself. <laughs> so as you can see in the right, the interface you will see it, or the player can see live in front of him during the lift. This would have been the case for our Limerick lads. Um, I just kind of have a no phone policy in the gym, so we try to keep video out of it. Um, you can get mean and peak velocity. You can see his previous reps, uh, peak power, or choose any metric you wish uh, to go on there. So velocity-based training, I suppose, where it came from, uh, or sorry, not where it came from, but I suppose traditionally, before velocity-based training, we would use percentage of 1RM to estimate load for our training programs. So, for example, if it's curl and right, our, our max uh, squat was 100 kg, um, we would program 85% of that 100 kg for the strength phase. So she might have to squat, let's say, that 80 kg for her five to six reps to hit the strength zone. Now, what velocity-based training does is instead of moderating weight, it's moderating velocity to target uh, a specific uh, zone and a force velocity curve. Um, I'll just run through that briefly. So the force velocity curve, if we look here, we have our, our y-axis and our x-axis along with velocity. Um, and this would have kind of, this work on, uh, I suppose, velocity-based training would have been introduced by Brian Mann. And essentially, as the load in a given lift increases and the maximum intent is there to lift it as quick as possible, the speed at which, speed at which uh, it moves decreases in a linear fashion. So we'd have a high force here for your maximum strength. And as we work down along, um, the speed will be increasing until we get to the bottom where we're moving the bar at 1.3 meters per second. So we have very light load on here um, and we're moving the bar as quick as possible. Now, um, depending on your period periodization model and your plan, um, it would depend on what zone you'd hit at what time. So when you talk about traditional periodization, you probably start to, at your maximum strength phase, moving the bar at less than 0.5 meters per second. And as the season progresses, you might be you move in the bar in three meters per second with less load. Now, uh, that is totally dependent on your periodization model. Um, I tend to use a, a bit of both, um, and I'd always have a speed strength and speed element uh, to my program. And so general application, generally what we're looking at, and you see it, see it on the phone here on the right hand side, we have mean and, um, mean and peak velocity. Um, so mean velocity is the measure of velocity from the start of the concentric lift phase to the end of the concentric phase. And the peak velocity is essentially one data point on that and it's the highest velocity attained through the concentric phase. So when I talk about concentric phase, if you think about the bench press, uh, it, it will be the upward movement from the chest. Um, we would generally use mean velocity with the Limerick lads. Um, but gen and generally speaking, there is a fairly high correlation between both mean and peak. So if your mean increases, your peak will often see an increase as well. Now, something I didn't use, but output provide is an angular velocity, which accounts for range of motion and consistency in angles throughout a lift. So what this will do is, and it's something I probably will progress in my program ne next year. If you had, say, a weighted squat jump as a readiness to train measure, you could place the output device around your hip. Uh, and as you squat down, it will tell you the depth of the squat or the angle of the squat. What that will do for you is, I suppose, uh, prevent um, athletes manipulating the data through a greater range of motion than it was acquired to create a greater um, velocity on the way up. So we're trying to get more consistent. Uh, and that's something we'll have to progress with next year. So the benefits and use of VBT, uh, I think calculate and monitor training loads based on fluctuations in performance, it enables the practitioner to target certain zone and force velocity curve. 
And the biggest thing is the continuous monitoring tool. So it, it monitors the performance of the athlete. It can monitor readiness to train and, and meaningful change using coefficient of variation. And Chris Petey, who's in alone, had a study on that, uh, which is quite interesting. But Tom Cummins would have actually been on that study also. Just pointed out that it, it is a reliable, it is, or sorry, it is useful to provide, um, I suppose, a readiness to train marker or subjective marker, which are a neuromuscular indicator. And just a real life example of that is I would have used CMJ as a readiness to train marker with uh, a previous team I was involved with. And if a player comes to you, and I suppose this is the art of SNC, he comes in after a two hour drive from Dublin to Limerick. Uh, it is not because um, he's neuromuscularly tired that he, he, he produced a poor jump. It may be because he hasn't moved in two hours and you're, he's coming in, he's in a rush, he, he gets three jumps. And you can't perceive that, to, that you can't perceive that as him not being ready for training. So to have that subjective marker on the side or a pursuit or uh, a pons, um may be beneficial to pair them together. And but finally, a huge benefit of VBT for me was motivation and intent. Um, I spoke to a friend of mine who worked in the AFL recently, um, and we just had a discussion the other day, and we were saying where we had a great um, benefit of this or great use of this was with athletes with a high training age where monotony might come into play. Um, so rather than just having, I suppose, uh, weights on a bar as an alternating stimulus, we now had another external stimulus where they're ch chasing velocity. Um, in addition, you can then pit players against each other relative to size or relative to, to body mass, um, and you have competition that way as well. Um, and particularly in team environments, competition is everything. Uh, they're there because they have a competitive nature, and that fuss is used huge benefit. Finally, um, and it isn't something we use massively, but I do believe in this uh, as being beneficial um, and it's priming. So providing new muscular stimulus to enhance acute subsequent performance. And when I say we didn't use it, we did, I just didn't monitor it. Um, so game day performance is multifactorial and difficult to assess in team sports. But there's research now that um, is saying that either in the 24 hours, but it's, it's most beneficial in the six hours before you play a game, that you have um, a neuromuscular kind of a stimulus, be that a high force output or high velocity output. Um, we generally just uh, use a, a high velocity, um, so, some general movement mobility and some, some velocity movements um, before a game. However, we, we haven't monitored this as of yet, but it is something to be, uh, I suppose, conscious of, and the benefits of it are becoming more clear in the literature. So it's definitely something we probably should be thinking about. So finally, just to move on to a case study, uh, return to performance. Um, this player is cruciate ligament. Um, I'm not going to name the player for obvious reasons. Um, and some of the data I look at in terms of percentages from uh, he's left limb to right limb rather than given raw data. So his metrics are there. You see in decent shape, 10.9% 10, 10 body fat and 84.2 kg and weight. And the video footage identified excessive extension rotation of the knee uh, during a single leg landing when he essentially uh, contacted the player in the air. They're both competing for a high ball and he came down with a leg, leg extended while trying to rotate and run backwards. Um, MRI identified partial tear to left ACL, low grade MCL tear and LCL sprain. The lateral meniscus showed normal morphology with both medial and telefemoral cartilage intact. Um, many, I suppose, ACL injuries are non contact or fairly accelerates, but since mass is too high and the upper body continues forward while the lower body is trying to turn, but this is very much a, a contact injury and uh, one with high forces. So I'm going to take you through a brief rehabilitation timeline. Now, the early stages of this timeline would, would very much have been led by the medical team. Um, but what I will do is I'll show you at what stages we use the output device to provide diagnostic markers um, for return to play and return to performance. So like week one to eight, um, there's some physios I, I saw online there, wound care, gentle range of motion exercises, uh, we do closed chain strength, your, your eyes are wall sits, et cetera. And then we would have been at the unit lateral balance exercises towards the end of the stage. And we be, begin 
cardiovascular training uh, on, on the bike with reduced range of motion. Week 9 to 17, um, manual muscle testing um, with hip flexion, extension, adduction, adduction, with progressive CV, advanced strength emphasis, and the, the player will have been up in Santry for an isokinetic test at this time, with the aim of being a 20%, uh, sorry, less than 25% uh, deficit between left and right, right foot. At this time, we would use a double XCMJ marker using the output device, um, like the lad showed you earlier. Literally just putting a strap around the foot, hands and hips, and a consistent uh, methodology to assess that throughout. As we progressed, we commenced open chain exercises, arc runs, um, cardiovascular, and advanced to uh, MES. Um, and we would looked at ankle stiffness and reinforced development and CMJ, single leg and double leg. We 25 to 33, we're getting closer to return to return to play now. Um, now what we're looking for is um, that the, the difference between limbs. So in single leg drop jump, we're looking that there's not a large difference between left and right limb. Uh, as that progresses, um, you're, we're looking for less than a 15% difference in CMJ. Um, obviously drop jump is a, obviously drop jump requires great mechanical forces. Um, and as we progress, we looked at bilateral strength, CMJ, uh, let, less than or greater than 90% of baseline. Uh, and that progressed. Every, every time we met, we were hoping that it'd be closer and closer to baseline and the left is close to right. Um, when, when we talk about reactive strength and the depth jump, this is something that we use here. So um, your reactive strength is essentially a jump to fight like long contact time. And I show you a video here where you have some of the rugby sevens that that's using. Um, there's two different uh, methods you can use. Um, and that would be depth jump and the 10 foot test. Okay, the depth jump is what we see here in the left. I'll just show you a video of that now. So essentially, you're getting off the ground as quick as possible and jumping as high as possible from generally uh, academic literature would say that should be 30, 30 centimeters step. And I'm sure why that's spot on. Rationale for choice of the depth jump for me, particularly with a return to play following ACLR, would have been. There are tests beyond normal mechanical exposure. There's high eccentric fo forces, which would have been very relevant to this player because he would require change of direction and deacceleration quite frequently. And there was a low learning time for my cohort. So re return to play versus return to performance or return to performance versus return to play. I think we need to be very, very careful. And Particularly when we, we look across the pond now and we see people talk about Van Dyke being back in six or seven months, we're not sure if that will actually happen. Um, but we need to understand the mechanism of the injury and the actual biological healing time of the injury when we're rehabbing. Sometimes s &C coaches, we see numbers and we see strength and we think the player is ready. But I just want to talk a bit about ret return to performance versus return to play. So the uh, both study was by Neil Welch. Um, and what he, what he advised, uh, Neil is the head of SNC Open Sanctuary, and by himself, Chris Richter, Kieran Moran, and Andy Franklin Miller advised a single subject approach to rehabilitation. So that details can be lost in between group approaches, and that we should objectively evaluate RSI data from baseline and LSI. Um, this is very, very important because if we, if we look uh, or take a common approach to every athlete, we will miss something big. You need to be able to objectively monitor the athlete at all times and, and adapt the program to suit that athlete at all times. Um, and these, uh, I suppose, RSI, the RSI data, strength data, they can all act as prognostic indicators along the way. So another study from 2020 was by Paul Reed from Aspetar, which would be one of the, I suppose, one of the most famous sports medicine hospitals in the world. Uh, and he was actually uh, working with Sean McAuliffe at the time, who's from the Western and another great practitioner. But important consideration from that paper was following uh, ACL research, following an extensive rehabilitation program, these were high level athletes. And strength was present, um, but they saw residual deficits uh, from six to 12 months in reactive strength. So if we were just basing our program off strength capabilities, this athlete could return to play. Nothing may have happened, but was he ready to perform in comparison to baseline? 
And this is where I think we need to start talking about return to performance or return to play. And um, so I suppose the take home from this is continue monitoring nine to 12 months with a focus on RSI. Just once, once the player has the strength uh, and is within baseline measures, continue to monitor that athlete. And I just cut through some of uh, this player stuff. So we would have made sure that his double leg and single leg strength was returned to baseline. So hex, hex deadlift, hip thrust, squat, and split squat were four primary lifts for his lower body. Um, double leg CMJ returned to baseline, which he did. He was at 102% uh, on return to play. Um, single leg CMJ was greater than baseline uh, and less than 40% LSI. And um, double, leg, double leg drop jump uh, was not at baseline um, on the nine month mark. So it was 2% under. And his single leg drop jump, uh, it was less than 10% LSI, but it wasn't as 94%, it, it wasn't back to, to baseline. So if we took the strength uh, indicators, uh, if we took CMJ as an indicator, um, we would have 100% said he was, he was ready to play, and he, he was ready to play, but his performance wasn't quite there. Uh, and the dim reactive strength uh, indicators would have said to us that the player needed to continue working on his reactive strength, which he did and continues to do. And um, we would have also looked at his technical ability on max velocity over 20 meters and change the direction he used a 505 asymmetry. And his left and right over three trials um, was 2.28 and 2.26 seconds. So uh, pretty, pretty decent in, uh, on that accord and very little imbalance. Um, so just to go on to find you to sum up our reflections and take home messages. Um, individualization of testing, and I suppose a working example of this would be by uh, a researcher called Rob Whitley, who has looked at individual, individual individualization of hamstring injury and return to play in addition to what we've already spoken about. Um, biological healing time varies, but regular testing can lead to prognostic indicators. User ears and eyes. Um, listen to athletes and their perceived responses. Single subject approach, sorry, a mistake there, for tailored interventions. Unilateral strength exercises, avoids comp compensatory movement effects and addresses strength deficits. It's a continuous screening tool, in addition with your eyes and ears. So, Number four, build a strong athlete, but transfer of strength must be considered. So rate of force development is very important and the ability to apply this force on the field. And a working example of this would be, while well, range of direction is dependent on external force, for factors such as speed and degree of cut at 30 to 40 degrees, we don't need many breaking forces. So reactive strength would be important in this. So for your midfielders who may not have to turn uh, 180 degrees too often and go backwards, this reactive strength would be very important for your half forwards who have who have long, fast runs. For a, a corner forward or a corner back who may need higher frequency of, of large degree from 110, say, to 180 degrees, um, we see a stronger association with strength in, in higher degree turns. Um, so you can, you can apply or individualize your programs as need be for this, or at least in the latter stages, uh, or the early stage of season, whichever you prefer, um, that we have a focus or program. And finally, Use your experience and data to inform future practices. Objectively monitor performance and adapt programs as necessary. There's a, a, a model in injury that I was only reading about recently. It's the Van Mechelen model. Identify incidents and mechanism of the injury, the prevention measure, and assess the effectiveness of the strategy longitudinally. Same accounts for SNC programs. We, we supply interventions all the time, but are we assessing them? Do they work? And are we willing to adapt? I think we should have a strong belief system uh, that will inform that will inform our our intervention, and then evaluate our intervention post season and see if we make any manipulation to it that will progress our, progress us come forward. Um, just a reading list and references. I think these will go up online afterwards, and they may help around this area. Um, and thanks very much. And, and just a word of output, lads, for anyone that hasn't used them. Um, I don't say this lightly. I look for validity and reliability in every device I use. It's very, very important to me that I, I can I can give accurate feedback to athletes. Um, but what trumps that is these lads are just good people and very good to deal with, provide a very good uh, support system with the rest of the staff. And I couldn't recommend them highly enough to work with. Um, thank you.
Thanks a million, Mikey. That was a, a fascinating talk. And I think uh, I learned a lot as well myself uh, to take into my own training. Um, just so everyone knows now, we'll be taking questions in the chat here. There's already quite a lot coming in and we'll be speaking for about another 15 minutes. And Mikey, myself and Dara will be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, if you're on Twitter or Instagram, you can also use the hashtag OutputGAA and one of our team will be looking at the questions there and inputting them to the chat as well. Maybe just to give Mikey a bit of a break as well, because um, that was fantastic, Mikey, and thanks for the kind words at the end as well. Um, some of the questions that just came through regarding the actual output system itself, and um, maybe they might be easier for us to deal with, and then Mikey can take some regarding the, the training and, and utilization of some of those techniques. So uh, Keith was asking how valid and reliable is the system with it? <clears throat> Probably the easiest um, spot to, to kind of come across that is if you go to the output website, I'm actually just going to share over you, Martin, here. And you go to the evidence base. You can see that there, Martin, yeah? Yep. So if you go to the evidence base here, <clears throat> this will outline all our in, uh, internal and published work around the system as well with it. And to also flag that we're currently in the process of getting um, these externally validated with people like Tom Commons, who's mentioned in the University of Limerick, Greg Half in the Eda Cowan University for a number of our different metrics as well, uh, Pedro Alcaraz and UCAM as well. The other question then that was asked around pricing as well. So again, the easiest position to, to probably go with that is the join now tab here. You'll see the annual and monthly options here. You can join output um, at those at this and click into it. You choose the prices dependent on the number of sensors and the number of athlete profiles that you add to the package with it. it. will calculate a price up here with it. And then what you can do is if you're requiring a higher number of sensors than, than are outlined here as well, uh, actually it'd be probably ideal if you request a demo or we can go through it in more detail and kind of develop a solution that best suits your needs with it. Great stuff. So, so with that, we've started to get a few questions in the chat and please feel free to keep them coming. A very interesting one here from Alexandra, who's asking, Mikey, effectively, in addition to the, the measures you spoke to, what are the anthropometric monitors that you also use and track throughout a GA season? Um, we, we use a DEXA, um, which is probably, I suppose, close enough to gold standard. Um, so height, weight, weight and all the... I suppose all the metrics the Texas can give us, we don't use skin folds um, just because I find it's uh, more, I suppose it, it's more science efficient and it, it provides reliable data for us. We use the same Dex machine, the same scanner all the time as well. That's great. Thanks, Mikey. Another very interesting one, and actually I'd, I'd love to hear more about it more because I see more and more of it happening. Uh, someone's asked, do you have any references about the priming? But I think even just more information on how the priming works on a match day and the, the neuromuscular uh, adjustment that, that you use and the type of exercises would be very interesting. Yeah, there's some references in that reference, reference list, but there's there's plenty more out there. And uh, the Hedis and C in their institute at the minute would would have recently wrote an article on it as well, if you can find them on his Twitter page. And the, I suppose, it, it's it's not even new. It's out, It's there a while. Um, on match day, what we do, we don't have access to a gym on match day. Like it, I was in um, the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff before. They actually have a gym next to their dressing room uh, out in the out in the tunnel, and so they can go in uh, before a match or before they, they begin, or they can do their activation there, where they can get either a heavy or light lift. And what that what that's meant to do is stimulate the muscular system. In, in essence, what we would do is a bit of mobility and low level kind of stimulation. It's still a new concept. And I think when you're introducing any concept, you kind of have to start low and, and build once you get to trust and relationship to the players. Because in introducing something like a high velocity lift or a high velocity jumps before a game would be pretty uh, new to GA players, pretty new to majority of, of sport at least. They prefer to sit down on the couch or have their meal, pre-match meal and their normal routine. So when you're affecting routine, I think it's important to think about the behavior change element of it um, and issue something low level, maybe just jumps before you start bringing in resisted jumps or throws or bits and balls and things like that. So it's something that is in early stages for us, but that we would look to progress um, for sure. Thanks, Amelia, Mikey. And actually a very interesting one here. We were actually having a chat uh, about this yesterday. 
someone's kind of asking about the link between uh, the data that you're getting on the objective markers and then the psychology of the athletes themselves. So you mentioned during the talk around intent, but this person asks, can you find that the athletes become too focused or obsessed on the figures? So I know that you spoke yesterday very interestingly about how as a practitioner you use the data to best effect and in a personalized fashion with each athlete. So uh, a little bit of information on that would be fantastic. Yeah, they can become uh, focused on that, but I suppose that comes down to your periodization side of it as well. When you really want uh, that competitive edge, and I know I want it on game week, so I put a larger emphasis on hitting uh, high velocities in game week. I have the screens up in front of them. Um, in a pre-season, um, I also want this to be intent to be there. I want them to be excited about it. So there might be there might be weeks during the pre-season where, where I don't bring the velocity measures out and um, like during a heavy strength phase I can see with my eye fairly accurately uh, whether the power speed is correct I know weights to lift and I'm monitoring the master lifting each week and um, so I suppose interjecting at different times and using it to your benefit but I, I was chatting to the lads uh, the other day and where you have to be careful with it is you have to have full belief in your program you have to ensure that the players are ready because if, if the players are coming up to a big game or a big race or um, whatever whatever the athletes may be, they need to see good data on match week. And this system won't lie. You're not going to manipulate it. So if you have ba- if they get a poor result, why is that? Do, does the athlete want to see that? Um, now, coming up to the big games this year, I, I was fully sure that they were in a good place and thankfully the numbers resulted uh, in that. But that's where the art comes in. Uh, when to, I suppose, when to interject with it, when to use it, when to put more, when to put most relevance on it. Um, and the other side of this is it, the, the data can be, for in terms of individuals, it can be very much made relative. So relative to body mass, relative to position. Um, so find a way that that lead succeeds no matter what. Um, and that they, they feel that psychological benefit, particularly on game week. Mikey, okay, someone's asking here about uh, recommend using BVT with youth athletes. I don't know if you have any experience in that. And uh, I talk about uh, it being utilised in some of our environments as well. Yeah, I, I was chatting to the lads and maybe you can have a chat about it. I, I didn't have to take management until this year. So although I was looking for velocity, high, high velocity movements, I, I didn't have it. So I, I tried to over to you guys. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And um, actually, with Output, we're very lucky in the last year to have started working with a lot of youth sports organisations, including sub-academies of pro clubs, but also uh, schools around the country as well who are looking to apply more kind of objective and effective long-term athlete development. And what, what I'd say to the VBT is there's one real advantage that you get uh, in the teenage athletes, which is if they've traditionally only been focused on uh, almost the macho thing of how much weight you get on the bar, the VBT uh, allows them to focus on something that's more meaningful, which is the velocity and the power that they're producing. So it's a really good way to get them uh, objectively seeing the progress they're making over time as they start to enter the weight room, but also to you know make sure that they're not focused solely on upping the weight. They're actually focused on improving their performance. Uh, and then the other thing to flag, Mikey very briefly introduced our angular velocity-based training pathway. And for athletes who aren't maybe yet ready for uh, big loading or that type of thing and weightlifting, Using range of motion as the major guide for that athlete can be a great way to reinforce correct technique early in their strength conditioning journey. So um, certainly think that the measurements can be applied at the youth athlete level, but they may be applied quite differently than to to athletes with a greater training age. Yeah, great. Um, here, another question for female athletes. Is there any specific data that can be logged or considered for menstruation weeks when hormone changes could affect training? Um, we actually don't have that embedded in the system at the moment, but are looking to do something around that and structure that. At the moment, the graphing that you can see in the hub and um, in particular can be utilized to kind of track trends in their data over extended periods of time. So it can be used to look at that, but I think that would be a really nice addition into it and something that we look towards moving in the future as well. Yeah, there's a, a couple of questions coming in here, which I think is uh, always very pertinent in SNC planning and periodization. Uh, and broadly speaking, Mikey, they focus around how you, how many times you test a year and then how you choose testing intervals and then also how you set targets for the time in between. So I guess how you 
set achievable but also meaningful targets and how often you test with the, the uh, Limerick setup? Yes, so, so there's an ideal answer here and the real answer. Last year was an absolute disaster. Um, we tested at Hockley when we could fit it in. We had a really condensed season. We came back, which didn't allow much time for testing. So something like the output device gave me regular feedback. It wasn't intrusive. It didn't take away from the session. It, it added to the session. Um, so that was really important for us um, in that we were getting strength and power feedback throughout without having to actually specify time for it. Generally speaking, I, I think it depend, depends on your, your model. And when I was, I suppose, doing my master's in BSC, I would have been very much kind of oriented in terms of the traditional periodization model. Um, but now my mind has changed a small bit um, and I kind of adopt a more tactical periodization model, particularly on the field. Um, when you test, is the, the ideal scenario is you test before and each after each training phase, you get four or six weeks. Um, ideally, you get some some measure then. Um, now, our testing would be very much dependent, and I'm sure it is for others, that uh, depending on when league games are, when the championship is, um, we, we test around them. So like, you never would test on the weekend of a league game. Uh, and we're going to have six or seven league games probably in a row this year. So opportunity to test in, in the middle of that would be difficult. So the use of output would be, would, would be useful for that. I would say, though, like you, you want a baseline. Uh, and we have our physiological our feedback we test every kind of six weeks. Um, and we have our output stuff, uh, I suppose, weekly, really, you're getting feedback on it. So that's about it. Well, that's, that's great. Thank, thanks very much, Mikey. Um, so just a quick question, a couple that have come in on the tech that I'll just try to, to cover off in one before we get back to, to uh, Mikey's answers. So a few people asking uh, if this can be used for Olympic weightlifting derivatives. Uh, great timing. Actually, a question Mikey had for us as well recently, and we've uh, just developed an Olympic weightlifting tracking system for VBT that will include force and velocity variables that we're currently internally testing and will be releasing later this week. Uh, a number of people also asking around an iOS release. Uh, in the background, uh, our tech team are working on this uh, as a top priority. So later this year, we'll be launching our first iOS version. In the meantime, we supply Android devices. We can also recommend low-cost Android devices that help people uh, get set up and using output uh, prior to the iOS release later this year. Um, and then there was, uh, I think, Wesley O'Brien, who might be another car line man, so I better answer this one. Uh, is asking uh, if the sensors can be used in contact-based scenarios. So in general, at the moment, the system is predominantly focused on strength conditioning, physiotherapy, uh, and then kind of speed and agility analysis, not yet on-field analysis. Um, so predominantly would be more in the realm of um, outside of contact-based assessment. However, you can collect raw data, so raw accelerometer and gyroscope data uh, that could quantify impacts if you were to uh, analyze it yourself offline. So just to just to flag that. And just to jump back down then to the question. So uh, this has been an interesting one, uh, Mikey, if you, if you have a take on it. It's when working with youth athletes, do you have strength training standards and targets? And how do you define what is strong enough um, for, for, for different age groups? Um, definitely. Um, but again, it comes back to what I would have said in, in the talk. It, in both rehabilitation and both for strength, you have to take it case by case. Well, I do have generic strength standards. Uh, it, it's, to be honest, it, it's, hold on, it's four, it's three or four years since I, I, I've worked and had a team of UL athletes, so I'd be only guessing at what they were at that time. Um, I haven't for senior level. Um, obviously, that's something quite personal in terms of what we ask our Limerick lads, but I, I would take it case by case. But definitely with, with the youth athlete, uh, before strength comes mobility and stability. Ensure they move well, ensure they're stable. Um, identify when their growth spurt is going to be, be it, um, be it female or male, that's going to come at a different time. That peak height velocity, is going, they're going to be pretty insta or unstable at, at that time. So ha have a large uh, emphasis on mobility and stability. And if you get them right, uh, it's time to start loading and you can load during that phase as well um but in terms of quantifying it, i think it's down to the athlete or training age there's a lot of parameters there that's probably you have to come up with yourself unfortunately you don't have a straight answer for you 
no, thanks, Mary and Mikey. It was a great answer. Um, so just so everyone knows, we'll just keep going with the questions for another five minutes and then we'll be wrapping up. Uh, one question is, uh, people are asking, will we be sharing the recording of this afterwards? Uh, and the answer is uh, indeed yes. So we'll be emailing around a copy of the talk later today uh, for all of you to use and, and reference in, in your own learnings and, and applications. Um, there's a, a good question here, Mike, and I know that you do use it with the, the guys inside. So someone said that they've seen that Olympic weightlifting can help improve athlete power output uh, and increasing their velocity. Uh, have you seen this uh, yourself and do you apply Olympic weightlifting with the, the Limerick guys? Yeah, so we, we use Olympic weightlifting and kind of derivatives of it. Um, so uh, as, as Martin would have said there, we're kind of, it's a, not a problem, but it, it, it's a, a lot to come up with a solution, particularly where the bar rotates, um, come up with an algorithm to, I suppose, monitor um, our, our Olympic lifts and our, particularly our hang cleans and clean variations. Um, so I use it quite frequently. There's very little uh, better uh, to increase power output than uh, snatch and clean derivatives. Unfortunately, we don't have players, some players that are mobile enough to do the full Olympic lift. So like we, we'd swap, like for instead of a snatch, we might do a single arm snatch. Instead of uh, a full clean, we might do a hand clean. Um, you, could, you can do a dumbbell clean, but we, uh, we, we use the derivatives of Olympic lift and quite a bit yeah yeah absolutely and, and just for anyone who is wondering about the complexity of technique in olympic lifts and research on uh, more easy to execute movements with a similar effect uh, if you look up research from tim sushimel and um, from carroll university he's got some fantastic stuff coming out on that topic at the moment that i that would highly recommend um Patrick, you've just asked about the output system uh, that you see that we track a number of things uh, in terms of readiness, balance, and uh, you're asking, I guess, more widely around uh, assessment of concussions and injury. So a very good uh, question. And we, in our time in the Insight Centre and the UCD School of Physio, looked a lot at the use of balance as a marker of um, neuromuscular function before and, and after following um, head injuries. Um, the short answer is we, we already uh, have some end users that apply the balanced data to, to inform their decision making as part of wider protocols. Uh, and we'll also be releasing a blog on this in the near future about how the output system can help feed into those very complex assessments as well. Um, and then uh, I think it's probably a good time to say, Mikey, uh, Kiva Morris is saying thanks a million for a highly engaging presentation and quite a few people are, are seconding that. So. I would also like to, to second that and say thanks a million for, for everything today. Um, I think probably a great time actually to wrap up the talk. Um, and just to say from output and, and everyone here today, we're extremely grateful for the insights and the knowledge that you've shared with us today. Uh, and uh, really look forward to continuing to work with you throughout the, the next year and onwards. And uh, hopefully uh, after things start to normalize, we'll see you in person rather than just over Zoom. Yeah, perfect. Thanks very much for joining, guys, and thank, thanks to you guys, too. Cheers, everybody. And just to flag as well, I know we didn't get to any of the, all the questions with it as well, but absolutely feel free to email us through the, the website um, and uh, hit request demo in there as well, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that we didn't get to today as well. But thanks a million. Thanks for everyone for giving up their time as well. And look forward